a very good morning to all and uh, welcome to our microasia webinar series 2023 and uh, myself uh, is dr anindita nan ghosh uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our today speaker uh, dr vijaylata rastogi currently she is a professor and departmental head of jln medical college and associated group of hospitals of ajmer rajasthan she has completed her mbbs and md in uh, the medical microbiology and fdhr in molecular mycology she had 23 years of medical students teaching experience in nursing medical microbiology and clinical research uh, during 2014 to 2019 she worked as a nodal officer some coordinator of multidisciplinary research unit of icmr dhr at jln medical college and after that 2020 to 21 she worked as a nodal officer of covid lab and testing she is the member of mucor mycosis management committee and ic of the diagnosis and also the faculty of cisp uh, curriculum committee and medical education unit Dr Rastogi has supervised uh, more than 40 dissertation work uh, for the uh, postgraduate students and phd students she has published more than 50 original research paper in various national international index journal like springer elsevier uh, scopus etc she has uh, received extra mural funding as a research pi from icmr for a very interesting project named antibacterial activity and chemical characterization of havan smoke means the yagga dr rastogi credited to be of uh, many uh, awards like best poster paper award of 10th national conference of society of indian human and animal mycology year 2014 at coimbatore excellence in medical education research uh 2016 at rajasthan best paper award in mycology at e microcon 2020 and outstanding researcher award in microbiology at chennai 2020 and many more awards really dr rastogi is a great personality with lots of experience and awards and now we are going to enrich our knowledge about the laboratory diagnosis of human fungal uh, identification with uh, dr rastogi ma'am so uh, dr rastogi ma'am now the platform is fully yours you may start your uh, lecture uh, thank you all thank you so much uh, dr andita nan i doubt that i would like to thank you my peesha group and especially dr damedar beli shinor uh, my friend dr vinay kumar halur who have been instrumental in giving me the opportunity to present my knowledge in front of you and uh, it is going to be rather a discussion i believe at the uh with this uh, i would like to start the presentation on the laboratory diagnosis of human fungal infections uh to begin with let us understand that fungi stand somewhere intermediate between the animals plants and the protists and the prokaryotes bacteria and protists but prokaryotic group uh, and the scientific community here i think uh, understands that better on the difference between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes the fungi are different from the animals and the plants in many ways they lack chlorophyll so they differ from plants but they have uh, they have a true nuclei being eukaryotes they have cellular organelles these are features common uh with the animal kingdom but they don't have the cholesterol as a part of the cell membrane and many more other differences so it's not proceeding yes classically they have been divided into uh five phyla which has been recently updated to nine i was just uh, going through the review material yesterday but classically it is divided to five phyla fungi of medical importance are classified under these phyla the oldest being the chytrids which consist of the flagellated spores and from them separated the zygomycetes consisting of all the agents that were causing the panic in the last few years that is the covid associated mucormycosis they all belong to this class the glomerulomycetes this 
consists of the fungi that exist as the mycorrhiza that is symbiotic relation with plants and help the plants in obtaining nutrition. The ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes group, these consist of fungi that survive either as saprophytic and on the decaying plant matter. And they are also of medical importance. So with this short introduction, let us move further. To understand the fungal infections, first, uh, we need to also understand, you know, what the fungi are, how they look like when we try to diagnose them in the laboratory. So classically, they consist of the yeast and the mold forms. The yeast forms are the round, oval, or the spherical forms. And when they elongate, they form the pseudohyphae, which are short elongated structures. Uh, structures. These are sausage shaped, and they can also form true hyphae, which are elongated filamented structures, which can be branched, unbranched, septate, or unseptate. So these are the morphological forms of an yeast. The petri plate you are seeing here is showing the growth of an yeast. Very pasty, creamy colonies. The color may vary from off white, white, cream, red, orange. You know, you can see all the colors on the petri plate when you work in mycology. Coming to the molds, this is the colony characteristic of a mold. This is typically Aspergillus niger growing on a petri plate of Sabrox dextrose agar. The basic medium that is used in mycology for uh, obtaining primary cultures. When you make an LCB mount or a KOH mount preparation of these, you see a picture like this. If in this case it is, if it is mucor or rhizopus, then you will see a structure like this with broad aseptate filamentous structures along with the sporangia. You can see the a uh, round spherical structure here from which are coming out the sporangiospores. This is a typical characteristic feature of a mucor a mycosis agent, which can be a mucor or a rhizopus. And there are also other structures which you can see in case of other filamentous fungi, which we will uh, soon discuss in the coming slides. Apart from this, you also have you also have dimorphic fungi. Classically, the fungi are divided into the yeasts, yeast forms, the mold forms, and the dimorphic fungi. If the fungus grows as a mold form, that is a filamentous form at 30 degrees centigrade, as well as at 37 degrees centigrade, it is classically known as a mold. Whereas if it grows in, a, in the form of an yeast, that is pasty, creamy colonies on the plates, at both the temperatures, that is 30 and 37 degrees centigrade, it is called an yeast. Whereas if a fungus grows as a mold at 30 degrees centigrade and at 37 degrees centigrade, if it grows as an yeast, that is, it is showing dimorphism, thermal dimorphism, they are called as dimorphic fungi. Examples of dimorphic fungi are histoplasma capsulatum, blastomyces dermatitidis, Paracoxidioids brasiliensis, coxidioids imitis. We will come to this again in the coming slides. So basically, for the beginner, for a mycologist with a curious mind, you, what you need to know is fungi have two different morphological forms, the filamentous forms and the yeast forms, which on the basis of which they are divided into moles, yeasts, and the dimorphic fungi. And this will depend upon the temperature at which you are incubating your culture plates. The traditional culture medium used in mycology is the Sabrox dextrose agar, in short known as the SDA medium. Again, I want to show you certain uh, the, the characteristic of dimorphic fungi here. You can see it here that this is a type of Sabrox dextrose agar, very commonly used uh, medium in mycology, on which you can see a mold form growing. This is at 30 degrees centigrade. And when you make a tease mount preparation of this colony, you will see filamentous fungi. And here you are able to see tuberculate macroconidia, which is suggestive of histoplasma capsulatum, a very, very dangerous uh, dimorphic fungi. Whereas the same fungus from the same sample, when you have inoculated it on yeast, uh, uh, the yeast forms appear on BHI blood agar, that is brain heart infusion agar. It yeast forms, it converts into the yeast forms. And when you make an LCB mount preparation of this, you will see beautiful budding yeast like this, small ones here. Of course, they are, um, they are very dangerous to work with in the laboratory also. So this is about the dimorphic fungi. Now coming to why we really want to 
diagnose the fungi in the laboratory. Why are they a big public health threat? I think uh, a century before, these were not really very troublesome, or even uh, it is just since two decades, two to three decades, that the fungal diseases have been on the increase. This is because of various changing environmental, socio-economic factors. But the most important cause is that fungi are opportunistic infections in general, and they, it is increasing because of the increase in the population having weakened immune system. This is because of increase in the cancer patients, transplant recipients, other people taking medications that weaken the immune system, and because of the tremendous increase in the population of people living with HIV and AIDS. So the most important factor is weakened immune system will favor the uh, uh, will favor opportunistic infections due to the fungi of which cryptococcus and aspergillosis top the list in a hospital setting there are various causes that contribute to the fungal infections because a hospitalized patient is usually uh, admitted with um, he is usually more sicker than a person in the community who comes in the opd isn't it and he is on most of the time he is given broad spectrum antibiotics he may be on chemotherapy if he is a cancer patient uh, there are invasive procedures going on in the hospital and the hospital environment itself favors the selection of new and drug resistance fungi in the environment and the already sick patient may uh, be invaded more easily by these pathogens there. So hospital associated infections due to the fungi are gaining, uh, it is escalating these days and the most common hospital acquired infection uh, when we talk in the context of the fungi is candidemia. Candida auris is infamous in this uh, in this uh, subject, and we will talk about it again in the coming slides. The other category is the community acquired infections due to the fungi, of which uh, it is determined by wh what sort of a ecological niche you know that uh, in which the patient is exposed to. These days, because of deforestation, you know, rapid urbanization, rather greedy urbanization, and because of uh, degradation of the land, air, and the soil. The environment is perturbed and the ecological natures are all disturbed. So the fungi which are naturally present in these habitats are coming out and man is uh, gaining access to this and they are invading the human host, especially if the weakened immune system is a contributory factor in such cases. Also, uh, examples are coccidiomycosis is prevalent in the western part of USA, whereas blastomycosis and histoplasmosis are present in the eastern part, that is the New York and Washington part of the uh, USA. If we talk about the Asian countries towards the southeast, more towards the eastern countries, you have more of Peniceliosis magnifi, now known as staleromycosis. You have sporotrichosis, you have chromoblastomycosis, the uncryptococcosis. These are highly prevalent in the most eastern part of the Asian countries. So definitely there is a role of the environment and ecological niches uh, that contribute the growth of particular type of fungi and whenever man gains access into it, rather he intrudes into their natural environment, uh, then the man is susceptible to such infections. So given uh, ha having gained this knowledge, now when to highly suspect a fungal infection? We can ask certain questions when and if you get the right answer, you can guess that it is probably a uh, fungal infection because otherwise fungal infections mimic uh, infections due to any other causes like bacterial or the protozoal or the viral. But if you can get specific answers to these questions, I think usually a clinician can click, uh, he can guess that it is a fungal infection. We were not responding to standard course of broad spectrum antibiotics. Yes, fungal infection is the most common cause in these cases. Where do you live and travel? Suppose you have traveling to the western part of USA and after that the person has got sick with fever, you know, malaise and slight cough and headache and neck rigidity, then yes, these are symptoms of probably paracoxidioidomycosis uh, that has uh, ensued because of travel to an endemic place where it is endemic. 
what types of activities are you doing like suppose uh, uh, a person like me say a professor who is sitting in probably most of the time in the ac rooms and it's a sort of a sedentary job working more with the brains less with the body then i may be susceptible to a different type of infection whereas a person working outside uh, in the fields say an agriculturer uh, agriculturist so he will be more susceptible to infections from the soil he can he is more susceptible to say mycetoma to the sporotrichosis and in all the systemic infections which uh, the spores of which are usually present in the soil and in the animals like the pigeons and the bats so it will all depend upon the type of activity we are all doing do you have a dog or a cat yes zoonotic infections can also be fungal and it is being uh, uh, transmitted very fast these days example is one is the sporotrichosis that is coming up have you recently taken antibiotics yes after an antibiotic therapy uh lowers the immune system weakens the immune system changes the gut microflora and it can lead to uh, fungal infections are you taking any medicine that affects your immune system definitely yes this happens in the case of cancer patients on chemotherapy patients uh, having chronic diseases and are on multiple antibiotics and steroids definitely that immune system is weakened and fungal infections are a very a big possibility in them are you receiving chemotherapy or radiation treatments yes we have talked about it are you living with hiv aids yes this is one of the commonest cause of opportunistic fungal infections throughout the world are you hospitalized or recently discharged long term hospital stay and uh, the things that nc along we have already discussed about it so it is a high risk factor for gaining fungal infections have you recently had a transplant yes transplant recipients do you have symptoms of pneumonia that are not getting better with antibiotics yes these are the conditions that give a clue that yes you are suffering from a fungal infection laboratory diagnosis of human fungal infections is important from the ensuing talk we have already understood that uh, fungal infections mimic other infections you won't be able to distinguish the signs and the symptoms due to say a bacterial Uh, bacterial uh, infection like bacteremia septicemia which can also be because of this so you need laboratory diagnosis for this species identification and antifungal susceptibility test decide the choice of antifungal drugs uh, uh, antifungal drugs that are available in the market are usually amphotericin b voriconazole posaconazole echinocandins that is casper fungi these are widely used for treatment of fungal infections but they have specific uh, uh the spectrum of activity of these antifungal drugs is specific say voriconazole will not be effective against a mucormycosis case in the covid associated mucormycosis amphotericin was sold in multiples and millions voriconazole will not be effective in such case but then how do you know that you need to give amphotericin or voriconazole or echinocandin you will have to work it out in the laboratory to know the fungus whether it is a mycormycotic agent or it is an yeast infection within the yeast also there is susceptibility varies say candida cruzi is resistant to fluconazole inherently resistant so if a if an isolate has come out of a patient sample that is showing it is candida cruzi there is no fun in giving any fluconazole to that patient because you know that it is intrinsically resistant so you will have to choose other drug options maybe amphotericin b So uh, this is to say that species identification and antifungal susceptibility test is very 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 important because it decides the choice of antifungal drugs and the further course of management. Uh, the, these drugs show species specificity, which we have just talked about. They are very very costly, so you have to. decide whether if at all you want to give antifungal or not maybe it is not a fungus at all it is maybe a protozoal infection a viral infection or maybe a a multi drug resistant bacterial infection so if you can rule out that it is not fungal definitely you are saving the cost of treatment and the attendant morbidity and mortality that is there is much suffering uh, when you have to you know uh, empty your pockets that itself becomes a big stress also these drugs these antifungal drugs show high toxicity like ascorbamin uh, shows vascular thromboflebitis voriconazole is these fluconazoles and azoles are known to cause uh, liver damage and amphotericin is you know main famous in causing kidney damage so they cannot be used for long and they have to be used very very prudently if you want your patient to 
become better and not worse. Timely treatment uh, helps in prevention of disability and death. So definitely laboratory diagnosis is a must. It also helps in knowing the epidemiology and especially in the case of reportable fungal diseases. Uh, in USA, they have a list of reportable fungal diseases. So you first need to know what to report, what you have identified from the patient sample. Only then you can report, isn't it? And also it decides health policy and funding. So definitely laboratory diagnosis of fungal infections is a must. Outbreak potential is there in uh, many of fungi uh, that we are seeing these days. Uh, recently, there was emergence of mycosis in Brazil. That is an ongoing uh, sort of a prosodemic here in India because of drug resistant dermatophytosis due to trichophyton endotini. And other highly pathogenic strains are also uh, getting flourished these days because of uh, climate change and other reasons. The, also, they may also be implicated in allergy. Fungal allergy is also common, especially in the case of aspergillosis. Uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is a special entity. Apart from this, after the COVID pandemic, uh, we are increasingly uh, realizing that there is one separate entity called as the iris. This iris, uh, mind, this is not the iris of the eye that we all know. It is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And in this, the T cells of the patient react abnormally to a pathogen. And this shows that there is some immunological derangement happening in the patient's body that is leading to exaggerated inflammation to even, even uh, to particular pathogens. And this increased inflammation is leading to increased cytokine release and uh, the damages that ensue. It's not forwarding. Yes. How fungal infections are diagnosed? So definitely we have come to a conclusion that we need to diagnose the fungi in the laboratory. It is not possible to diagnose just by checking the pulse of the patient, you know, or by seeing the face of the patient or by seeing the symptoms. It's not possible. So I think that is clear by now. So once in the laboratory, what you're going to do? Whenever a patient comes to a doctor that is a physician, uh, we all have, uh, you know, gone through this experience at some time or the other we have seen our relatives getting admitted in hospitals going to hospitals you know what what happens laboratory testing that is evidence-based medicine is very very uh, essential in the case of fungal infections uh, diagnosis usually the samples will be collected based upon the symptoms suppose a, suppose a patient comes to you with say a wound infection somewhere on the hand or the or the leg then and it is exu exuding some pus or uh, there is an aspirate, something that can be aspirated out, or a grain is coming out, as in the case of mycetoma. I will be talking about it soon. So, in these cases, these samples will be collected a biopsy sample from, say, a deep wound infection, exudate and pus from the superficial wound infections or draining sinuses, sputum and bowel, that is bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. Ball stands for bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. It is an invasive procedure to obtain this specimen, but it is very good in diagnosis. The sputum and bowel. Sputum is what? When you cough out. When you cough out, the sticky substance that comes out of the lungs is the sputum. You need to differentiate it from the saliva that uh, normally we drool out, you know, that helps in digestion. Sputum is different. It has to be expectorated from the lungs during a cough. And this sample, these two samples are taken whenever there is something related to the respiratory system and you suspect a fungal infection. Urinary tract infections due to fungi are also common. So urine will be collected. Uh, a midstream urine is all, always preferred. That is the first part of urine has to be passed out. And uh, the second part, the middle, of, middle part of the urine, the stream has to be collected. Say 5 to 10 ml of the urine has to be collected in a sterile container and it should be sent to the lab. Uh, skin samples, corneal samples, hair and nail clippings, wound swabs and grains. These are also the other samples that we very, very commonly receive in our laboratory. Especially the skin sample, the hair and the nail samples and the corneal scan, scrapings. These are infections of the skin, nail and the hair due to fungi is called as dermatophytosis or dermatomycosis. And corneal scrapping is uh, required. That is the cornea is the is this part of the eye that is a black part of the eye we can see uh, whenever there is an ulcer in the eye because of say an injury or some other reason you have to the patient comes to you with a burning sensation in the eye that is redness and there is loss of vision then you will have to scrap the cornea and send it to the laboratory 
to know whether it is a fungal infection or is it due to bacteria or some other pathogen. So these are the samples that you usually receive in the laboratory. They have to be transported to the laboratory as soon as possible. And if there is a slight delay, they can be refrigerated, except for the CSF sample, CSF sample and the blood sample. Uh, the CSF cannot be refrigerated because otherwise the possible pathogens in it may die. So these samples, you can see here, the biopsy exudates past sputum, skin, corneal hair, nail, wounds, paps, and greens. These samples, once they are received in the laboratory, the first thing that a mycologist will do is to observe using the direct microscopy. The microscope is the basic tool uh, for any microbiologist because with this he can uh, diagnose many things. KOH stands for potassium hydroxide. Uh, 10 to 20 percent KOH is usually preferred whenever you deal with the skin, corneal, hair or the nail samples. For the nail sample you may have to probably increase the percentage of KOH up to 30 percent. So a drop of KOH is added to the sample that is say here a skin scrapping uh, we, I, we, I will demonstrate in detail about all these things in the coming slide so what i want to highlight here is the methods that are uh, available in the laboratory and usually done is a k-watch wet mount or a calcofloor wet mount which requires a fluorescent microscopy in the microscopy uh, you will be able to diagnose whether it is an yeast or a malt the other method is culture Culture is usually done on sebrose dextrose agar in the form of a petri plate or a tube usually. And the uh, culture takes some time. It may take uh, from two to three days to up to seven to 10 days or a maximum of up to 21 days before which the culture cannot be declared negative. So up to 21 days, you have to incubate the sample inoculated on, these, uh, on this media in the laboratory at appropriate temperatures. Two different temperatures of incubation are used. 30 degrees centigrade and 37 degrees centigrade. Uh, we will again revise this in the coming slides. And the yeast, uh, suppose after the growth you have obtained on the SDA medium, it looks like an yeast, then you will do a gram stain, a LCB mount, and then you'll put some biochemical test. And the most important one in identification of the yeast species is the cornmeal agar morphology. I'll again come to this in the coming slides. Or if it is a mold, that is, you are able to see the growth of a fungus like this in the petri plate shown here, a filamentous growth, a fluffy growth, a feathery growth on the media, then it suggests that it is a filamentous fungi. So this filamentous fungi uh, will be, you will again make, uh, based on the growth characteristics, whether it is rapid growing, moderately uh, slow growing, or slow growing, it will be, and based on the color of texture, the obverse and the reverse of the colony, you will be able to identify the fungus. A micromorphology of the colony that is growing will be done. I'll come to this again. Slide culture technique is a very useful technique in identifying the colony of the fungus that is growing on the uh, culture media in the laboratory. And from this growth, you can also take them to molecular diagnosis uh, like PCR or sequencing, or you can also go for Malditoff and other automated uh, biomarker identification systems and metabolite identification systems. When it comes to blood, you know, blood is a very precious sample. We all, uh, you know, appreciate when somebody donates blood, isn't it? So when a blood of a patient comes, it is not actually a donation of blood. It is rather, you know, uh, the patient is in pain, actually. So he wants, uh, even, I'm ready to give my blood if you can diagnose what I'm having. You know, it's something like this. So blood is a very precious sample and so is the CSF, that is cerebrospinal fluid. The fluid that covers the brain within uh, uh, meningeal layers and it lines the whole of a spinal cord. This is the cerebrospinal fluid. So it is an invasive procedure. You have to prick a needle in the spinal cord and then obtain this sample. So it's a very precious sample. So these, uh, so and the bowel sample again is obtained by uh, an invasive procedure in inserting a bronchoscope and then taking out the sample from the uh, lung, uh, the bronchus that is. And serum is obtained from the blood, that is by centrifuging the blood, uh, the serum separates out on the top and the cells of the blood, that is the WBCs, RBCs and the platelets settle down. So both are useful in the diagnosis of fungal infections, the blood and the serum both. So these samples being very, very precious samples, they have to be taken care of in the laboratory with utmost care. 
blood culture you can do serological test you can do a, you do a blood pcr or other you know metabolite identification from blood so these things will be explaining in the coming slides in detail and uh, the the time duration that is taken for say the uh, the corneal scraping or a skin scraping to make a koh mount and then come to a conclusion as to whether a fungus is there or not it is just you know usually 10 minutes it can take say up to an hour depending upon the uh, keratinization of the sample the nail sample will take a longer time uh, uh, by the KOH, the KOH will take a longer time to dissolve out the keratin in the nail sample because it is a thick sample. So it may take up to one hour. It is the cheapest method, very rapid method, available in any laboratory, no sophistication is required, and the cost maximum, even if you get it done from a private lab. I'm, a, I'm in a government setup, and it is all done for free. If you go to a private lab, and if you ask for, uh, uh, please, doctor, please test my skin scrapping and tell me, uh, by direct microscopy, whether I'm having or not. So it will take just 100 rupees. The blood and the body fluids are definitely, they have to, you have to go for fungal culture, automated fungal culture systems are available. And the cost maximum is up to 2000 usually. And it takes from two to up to seven days for diagnosis of uh, infection, uh, fungal infection from the blood. So usually invasive fungal infections. In these cases, fungi appear in the blood. And however, it takes from up to two days to seven days to diagnose. Biopsy tissues and swabs of fungal culture, the, it is a very conventional method to do it in the lab by direct microscopy and culture. And the cost maximum is 500 rupees only. So these are all very affordable tests uh, that are present. And so fungal diagnosis in a conventional uh, laboratory is not costly at all. It is very affordable. And uh, so all people can utilize this. Again, coming to the direct microscopy, I want to show this is a very, very effective tool. I told you it's very rapid. It's the cheapest. Instantly, you can give a report. And that report can help the clinician in deciding uh, the further course of action, whether there is a yeast infection, whether there is a mold infection, and based on that, what drugs can be uh, instituted for the management. So these are some of the uh, direct microscopic pictures. See, this is the direct microscopic picture of a corneal scrapping with KOH, 10% KOH. It's showing thin, delicate, filamentous, highline, hyphae, which is suggestive of a dermatophyte. Dermatophyte infections are very, very common in India and also worldwide. This is a 10% KOH mount preparation of the vitreous humor. Vitreous is the thick, viscous fluid that is present behind the lens of our eye in the interior of our eyeball. And this gets infected. It's uh, usually an endophthalmitis case, or it is um, like this. A vitreous sample is, again, it's an invasive sample. You have to... Uh, put a needle into your eye and take out and aspirate it. And this sample is sent to the laboratory to know whether uh, infection is present or not. So when you do a KOH mount, see here, we can see uh, septate, highline, branched fungal elements here. So within 15 to 30 minutes, you can you know diagnose whether a fungal infection is present or not. And the report can be sent to the clinician. So this is very, very useful. To enhance the... Um, uh, detection, sensitivity of detection of the fungal elements in direct smears, we can add a fluorescent stain like calcoflor white. Traditionally, it is used for whitening of the uh, whitening in the textile industry, but it is also useful in mycology to highlight the fungal elements because it binds to the chitin in the cell wall of the fungi. And they fluoresce. When you observe it under the fluorescent microscope, if a fungus is present, because of attachment of the stain, to the fungal wall, that is the chitin, they fluoresce. So you will be able to pick it up very far, just like we highlight our notes, isn't it, with the highlighter pen? So it highlights the fungus. So this is a uh, India in preparation of, uh, say, a CSF sample, uh, cerebrospinal fluid sample. And you are seeing here the capsulated budding yeast, which are suggestive of cryptococcus. Again, this takes just an hour to report. And it can be very, very life-saving because uh, you cannot suspect whether it is a 
fungal meningitis or a bacterial meningitis. Usually in a child, say an HIV positive child, uh, the child is suffering from fever, neck rigidity, pain, drowsiness, refusing to feed and all the symptoms will be present. He will be admitted to the hospital. Uh, so the clinician will think of meningitis, what can be the causes, whether it is bacterial, fungal, parasitic or viral. So he will take the CSF sample, send it to the laboratory. And if we can do an nigrosin or an India in weight mount, we can clinch the diagnosis within just, say, an hour. And you can send the report and the clinician will immediately start treatment, say, with vodiconazole uh, for cryptococcus uh, neoformans. And the child will be OK very, very soon. Without diagnosis, the child will not get the specific antifungal and it may remain in the hospital for uh, God knows how long. And so the morbidity and mortality, you can always avert using such small preparations. Gram stain is still again a corner stay in uh, not only in microbiology, but also in mycology, where uh, by staining the sample with a gram stain, you can identify the morphological structures that are present in the sample and based on that you can diagnose whether it is a bacterial one or it is a yeast one as you can see here the budding yeast the purple colored budding yeasts this is the gram stain of a sputum direct uh, gram stain of a sputum uh, sphere showing the budding yeast and the pseudohyphae suggestive of invasive candida infection so these are all very very useful in the laboratory diagnosis of fungal infections now coming to the culture part, direct microscopy we have done. Now coming to the culture part, the same sample. It, it will be inoculated onto the sabros dextrose agar slant or to the sabros dextrose agar plates. Yes, plates are uh, good in the sense that you can see the full colony morphology, but you cannot uh, incubate it for long because the media here is thin and it dries out fast. Also, the openable lids, you know, they get contaminated because of the white surface area in a lab. Whereas uh, the advantage of the tube is that you can keep it for a longer incubation. They don't dry out very easily. But the disadvantage is that you cannot see the full colony morphology. You know, they are all clustered together. But definitely you will be able to identify the growth, whether it is an yeast or a mold, and you will be able to note the characteristics. So this tube here is showing that this is Sabarot's dextrose agar with antibiotics on which, say, a sputum sample has been inoculated. And it was incubated at two sets of temperature, 25 degree and 37 degree. I'm sure you all know why the, we are doing this from our earlier discussions. At 25 degree centigrade, a mold form will grow. At 37 degree centigrade, an yeast will grow the best. So you can identify whether it is an yeast, a mold, or a dimorphic fungi by incubating it at two different I'm sorry, two different temperatures. I'm sorry. Yes, we'll be here. So we were here, uh, culture plates. See, um, so you did to incubate it at two different temperatures to know the uh, dimorphic fungi also and you have to keep it up to 21 days and depending upon the rapidity of growth in the colony morphology you will you will be able to identify which type of a fungus this is whether it is an yeast it is a mold you will see the obverse if this is a typical colony of trichophyton mentagrophyte on the reverse it gives a pigment by which you can diagnose it red colored pigment this is the growth of muca this is the growth of uh, rhizopus. This is an yeast growing on a sabros dextrose agar plate. So after microscopy and culture, we can also use special culture media supplemented with certain uh, additional components to identify certain fungi like the chromagar candida that will tell you the different species of candida depending upon the color of colony that you observe. The cannabinin. Uh, bromothymol blue agar. CGB agar is used for differentiation of cryptococcus neoformans from cryptococcus geti, which will give colored colony on this. This is birth seed agar on which cryptococcus neoformans gives a brownish black colony. So this is again useful in diagnosis of cryptococcus neoformans. The dermatophyte growth medium DTM is a very common picture in uh, most uh, conventional laboratories where you can differentiate different types of dermatophytic uh, colonies. So now coming to the next, that is the laboratory diagnosis using the micro 
morphology. Once a culture growth is obtained, you have to make a tease mount of it that is called as a lactophenol cotton blue mount. Or you can subculture it onto an SDA, uh, a cut portion of an SDA spherical portion on which you inoculate it on the corners. This is called as a slight culture. Put a cover slip over it. The fungus will grow and you can as such observe it under the microscope. So this is a very useful technique. And in case of yeast, Dalmo plate technique is used. Uh, so using these techniques, you can observe the micromorphology, like whether it is filamentous, what is the arrangement, whether there are microponidia, whether there are macroponidia, and uh, whether it is highline or it is pigmented. You know, these are the features that we see. And based on which, we diagnose the species of the fungus. Although it looks very interesting, you know, it's very useful also. Still, there are certain shortcomings of this conventional methods of uh, fungal diagnosis, that is direct microscopy, culture and histological diagnosis. Direct microscopy, the sensitivity is not very high. It's poor. And uh, it is difficult to get deep specimens also. So the superficial specimens may not be representative of the lesion. Species identification and antifungal susceptibility tests are not possible with direct microscopy. For that, you have to go for culture. But the culture results take a longer time, usually from 3 to up to 7 to 20 days. So uh, waiting for such a long time may not be you know, practically useful for the patient or the clinician. Uh, but sometimes it's really very, very useful, especially in chronic infections. Uh, when you give a result, even if at the end of, say, 14 days, the physician is very, very happy because he is able to identify the etiology and he's able to give specific antifungal drug to the patient and the patient may recover and go back home happily. So culture definitely has an importance. And the chances of contamination and uh, procuring the non-sterile specimens. During specimen collection, one has to be very, very, very cautious not to, uh, to you know, cleanse the area properly so that the normal common cells don't come up. Commensal fungi can also be there on the skin temporarily if it is not cleansed thoroughly. And it will lead to a misleading false positive results. So these are certain uh, small things but that we need to take care of when uh, we do the laboratory diagnosis. Histological diagnosis, again, it is difficult to get the deep specimens and species identification and AFST is not possible. But it is a good adjunct to culture to prove that uh, the ideological agent you have isolated is, is the cause of the infection. So all of them have their own merits and the demerits and uh, a combination of these will give better identification of the fungi. There are, uh, so how to overcome the shortcomings of this conventional procedures? There are certain non-culture based diagnostics tests also. That is uh, detection of pathogen specific antigen, antibody, cell wall components like chitin, 1, 3, beta, D, glucan, and galactomannan. This galactomannan detection is very, very specific for aspergillosis, invasive aspergillosis. And 1, 3, beta, D, glucan detection for other fungal infections. And detection of metabolites using spectroscopy and MALDITOF. MALDITOF is a very, very useful technique and is the most recent technology available in most of the in sophisticated mycology laboratories uh, for rapid identification of the fungi. Malditoff refers to matrix-assisted laser desorption, ionization, time of flight, spectroscopy. So this is a very rapid procedure. The only thing is the inventory cost initially, which amounts to up to 1.5 crores. But after that, the running cost is nothing. It's just, say, 10 rupees per sample, not even that. So the running cost is very, very low, but the initial inventory cost is very high, and hence most of the laboratories still don't have Malditoff. Nucleic acid sequence-based diagnosis like uh, PCR microarray are also uh, you know, very, very useful in rapid diagnosis of fungal infections. It's moving very slow. Yes. So coming to the molecular tests, uh, these are the era of molecular diagnosis, so we need to know about it. The most common uh, molecular test used is the polymerase chain reaction, uh, which I think you all know how it works. It multiplies the gene sequence, particular gene sequence that is specific to, say, that fungus into multiples of, say, 10 to the power 6, to 10 to the power 8, to 10 to the power 12. And at the end, the products are, you know, they're segregated. The amplified products are segregated, and they are 
you know identified using various methods and nucleic acid probe technology is also there that works in microarray where you know uh, the complementary strands to a particular gene sequence is immobilized on a matrix so you have to just add the sample if the sample has the particular fungal pathogen it will attach to the complementary probe on the matrix and then it will be detected using various techniques it may be usually fluorescent technology so microarrays are also offered and you can diagnose a, a multiple amount of fungi in just one sample you know you can go for that in one go you don't have to inoculate you know different different culture plates you don't have to uh, go for detailed identification processes which are very time consuming and laborsome so microarray technology rtpcr and malditof uh, malditof you can see it here this is the instrument of malditof um, and with an attached uh, computer of course the monitor and the sample from the culture it is processed and it is plated and it is kept on a uh, on the malditof uh, screen so ions are created from this sample and these ionization particles move upward and as they move upward you know depending upon the pattern that is created uh, the database that is present in the uh, system identifies it as to which fungus it is so it's a very useful technology and you can have the results in just say 30 minutes to one hour so that is really very very good isn't it we don't want a patient to lie down on the bed for and stay in the hospital for long say 7 to 21 days uh, so that the infection can be diagnosed and you know put him to empirical treatment till then so this is not the way of diagnosis so it's really we are welcome uh, technology uh, good technology in science that has come up that helps in identification of fungi very rapidly other apart from the molecular tests you can uh, also go for antigen detection tests uh, these are not very very popular they are popular only for candidiasis and cryptococcus and uh, they work on the principle of you know the complementary antibody is attached uh, to the latex particle or on the matrix or to the nitrocellulose membrane membrane in the strips and if the antigen is present in the sample fungal antigen is present in the sample it will bind to the antibody and then an antigen antibody complex will be formed and this complex will be then identified using a chromogenic substrate or a fluorescent tag you know uh, so this is how it works and it it offers rapid results so it is a very uh, it is a point of care test that can be used bedside uh, by a clinician who is not an expert in the field of mycology. Especially useful for cryptococcal uh, lateral flow assay, the IMI uh, cryptococcal antigen LFA test and the candida antigen lateral flow assay. So it's useful for the diagnosis of some of these yeast infections. I'm sorry. Yes. You, are, you can also go for a fungal biomarker detection, which is becoming more popular these days. Uh, this is FASIS machine. This is the first of its kind that detects uh, galactomannan, beta glucan and many other parameters uh, without, you know, in an automated fashion. Uh, so uh, people are having a good experience with this over these recent years. So it's a very, very good option. Uh, for fungal biomarker detection that is useful for uh, diagnosis of invasive fungal infections which are under increase these days apart from this you have the galactomannan platelia test it is a base test the agglutination tests and you have the fungital which detects the beta deglucan uh, again it is an elisa based test so these are the other options that are available for fungal biomarker detection because of the rapidity uh they are you know being preferred in many settings but they also have their own uh issues of false positives and negatives and low sensitivities uh, which we cannot discuss here because of the time uh, limitation any laboratory diagnosis is incomplete in the lab if we don't go for fungal uh antifungal susceptibility test you have identified the fungus but you are not testing it for its susceptibility to the most common antifungals that are used in our setting if the, this is not done then it is an incomplete uh, laboratory diagnosis so you have to do antifungal susceptibility test which traditionally we do the disc diffusion test according to the clsi guidelines we can go for an epsilometer test that is the e test or the microbroth dilution test. These are the standard conventional 
uh, procedures that are available in a lab for antifungal susceptibility testing. The microgrowth dilution test in-house is a very tedious procedure. But these are getting automated uh, these days with available of Sensi titer plates. You can see it here, Sensi titer plate. This is the Vitec uh, 2C automated identification and antifungal and antibacterial susceptibility uh, testing system. So because the process is automated, the variabilities and the contamination, these are all reduced. And you get a standardized report. And, and a timely report, usually. Uh, once the culture is available, the identification takes just one to two hours, and so is the antifungal susceptibility testing. So these are really useful uh, in a dedicated mycology laboratory. You also have other systems these days, automated systems like uh, uh, the MALDI. It also helps in antifungal susceptibility testing and detection of antifungal uh, resistant genes. So we can we have multiple options to work out the fungi and its antifungal susceptibility in the laboratory. Why is it not moving fast? Yes. Yes. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Can somebody say? Am I audible to everybody? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so coming to that, we have now uh, gone through, you know, the laboratory methods that are available for diagnosis of fungal infections, you know, the various ways, the direct microscopy, the culture, the molecular methods, the serological methods, that is antigen antibody detection, biomarker detection, automated identification systems, and the antifungal susceptibility testing. This is a, a generalized uh, thing that we have discussed. Now let us see what are the diseases that are prevalent in Asia. This being a micro-Asia network, I think we are all concerned more about the diseases that are prevalent in Asia and what we uh, can expect that we will encounter in our lab. You know, what sort of infections uh, we will encounter, what sort of samples we will, we will have to take, and what how best we can diagnose this. I think that is the context and the relevance of today's talk. So let us know a little bit about the uh, infections that are prevalent. Classically, the fungal infections are divided into the superficial mycosis, the subcutaneous, and the systemic or the deep mycosis. Of course, opportunistic mycosis is also a term we will be touching upon. And recently, allergy, that is iris syndrome, and poisonings. Poisoning uh, incidences are not much uh, here, but they are still there. So we need to know uh, how to diagnose these infections once in the laboratory. So uh, this is the CDC map that is showing. This is of 2017. It's a very good. Uh, it's a very good article that has uh, you know, listed this. You can all go through. Uh, global and multinational burden of fungal diseases. The estimated precision. This is in the Journal of Fungi 2017. You can all go through this. It has highlighted the global burden of various fungal diseases. See, you know, uh, to manage anything, you first need to know the uh, intensity, the severity of the problem, isn't it? So this is the problem statement. What is the problem? Global burden. You can see here very clearly that this is 1 billion. That is 1 seventh of the world population. Say it is 7, it has crossed 7 billion already. So 1 seventh of the world population is afflicted with dermatophytosis or dermatomycosis. That is infection of the skin, the hair, and the nail. And again, uh, uh, say 0.75 billion is afflicted with, uh, just a second, it's too small for me to be visible. Yes, recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. This is also very, very common. Fungal rhinosinusitis is common. Severe asthma with fungal uh, sensitization. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in asthma. Chronic pulmonary aspergillosis and fungal keratitis. Keratitis means the, that is the uh, ulcer of the cornea, the ulcer of the white of your eye, the black part of your eye, you know, uh, that lies in front of the lens. This is called as keratitis. So these are very common infections, coccidioidomycosis and histoplasma mycosis. These are systemic infections, you know, very highly pathogenic organisms cause these diseases. Chromoblastomycosis, mycetoma, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and cystic fibrosis patients, and paracoccidioidomycosis, another dimorphic fungi, blastomycosis, another dimorphic fungi, you know, all the four dimorphic fungi, systemic fungal infections. You know, these are all a uh, big burden to the population world over and also in Asia. 
in asia telluromycosis and mucormycosis and sporotrichosis you know and disseminated histoplasmosis and cryptococcosis these are an additional burden especially in the case of the asian countries because of the increasing population of people living with hiv and aids so we need to know about these infections you know what uh, how we can go for clinical and uh, laboratory diagnosis of these infections in our setting what samples to take it's not for us yes. yes what samples to take how to proceed with the samples how best we can diagnose you know these are the things that come to our mind uh, the the moment we see that oh, oh wow this amount of uh, fungal diseases are existent in the world you know uh, this was not the case 30 to 40 years that is three to four decades before it is all totally man and created you know the change in the habits the socio-cultural environment uh, and the environmental changes that are happening it is all because of this otherwise fungi here you know they are very uh, innocent i should say innocuous otherwise they help in maintaining the uh, environmental cycle you know the live natural cycle that happens but when man intrudes into their environment destroys their niches then they come out in a virulent form you know defensive defensive attacks happen this is what is happening with all of us so coming to the superficial mycosis these are the various types of superficial mycosis one can encounter during your practice in your areas in your regions dermatophytosis also popularly known as ringworm affects the skin the hair and the nails diseases due to malassezia i'll show pictures of all of this in the following slides uh, uh, let me just know if uh, just 15 minutes before time yeah so that i can cut short my presentations tinea nigra black piedra caused by piedrea horti white piedra caused by trichosporon beigeli keratomycosis that is the infection of the cornea otomycosis that is infection of the external ear canal uh, so see this is the picture it's a very bothering picture isn't it we never definitely we don't want to see all this uh, on a relaxing sunday but to relax in future Sundays, for the future Sundays, I think if you want to relax, you will have to understand that these things are existent and how we can prevent such infections and treat them if at all it's happening. So these are the various presentations of dermatophytosis. You can see tinea corporis, that is when it affects the um, body parts. Tinea, that is the main body. Tinea cruri, when it affects the perineal uh, flexure area. Tinea barbi, the uh, infection or affecting the bordered areas, tinea pedis, that is of the foot, especially the web between the fingers, because uh, it retains moisture, isn't it? And moisture favors the growth of fungi. Tinea capitis, that is infection of the scalp. These are some of the forms of dermatophytosis that we very commonly encounter. At Ajmer also, we encounter all these uh, infections day in and day out. So this is the CDC map showing prevalence of trichophyton and microsporum two different genuses causing dermatophytosis world over. One is trichophyton, other is microsporum. There is a third one called as epidermophyton, but it is quite rare. So the, you can see the distribution. So people from Asia who are listening to this talk today, I think you can understand why we want to discuss about dermatophytosis because this area, including India and the southeastern part of Asia, these are you know high incidence areas, especially with the trichophyton. Vilesium mentagrophytes and trichophyton in the tini. So it's widely prevalent all over the world and also in Asia. Now, coming to the malassezia associated cutaneous infection, malassezia is a yeast form that causes infections in the form of the clinical pictures can be petiariasis versicular, where you can see you know, white uh, discolored areas on the skin. Uh, it can be a seboric dermatitis where flaky, you can call it as a dandruff in common language. So this is all because of malassezia infections. Again, a picture of pediasis versicolor of the affecting the back of the body, of the trunk of the body. And when you take a scrapping of this and you see it under the KOH, you know, this is how they appear. This is how they appear. You know, yeasts and small sausage shaped filaments. You can see this and you can clinch the diagnosis and you can treat them accordingly. Uh, you have to differentiate it from atopic dermatitis, of course, which is also which also presents with similar features. Other infection, uh, superficial infection prevalent is black and white piedra. Uh, I have just seen two cases in my 
uh, in my career over 23 years, I should say. Uh, so it's, I don't know what to say, whether it is very common here or not. I, it is rarer for me at Ajmer, but uh, maybe in Asia, you may be seeing more cases of this. And uh, this is, sorry. So this is how a knotted hair will come to your lab for identification. You have to tease it out, prepare a preparation, put it, put a culture on SDA where Piedrea horte may grow on microscopy. You will get a picture like this. And if it is a white Piedra, it will grow on, uh, it is a triposporon. So it is a yeast-like fungus, which will grow on SDA uh, as a yeasty rough colony. And microscopically, it will appear something like this with arthroponidias. So this is how these can be diagnosed very easily in the lab. Although they are superficial infections, you know, not dangerous, not harming the patient otherwise, it is usually of cosmetic reason that the patient come to you. We don't, we all want, you know, healthy, shiny hair, isn't it? We want uh, uh, glowing skin, a good complexion. So these things are, you know, hindrance to that uh, desire of all of us. So we are all bothered about how we look, isn't it? So these are troublesome and hence the patient presents to the skin and the STD OPD, usually the skin, uh, skin OPDs with all these symptoms. So now coming to the another superficial mycosis that is subungual onychomycosis. You know, the terms I understand maybe for the non-medical people who have joined here, it may be a little bit difficult to grasp these terms, but actually really not. Onycho literally means the nail. So any fungal infection affecting the nail, uh, nail portion and the uh, subungual portion that is beneath the nail, the nail bed, it will be called as a onychomycosis. These are the clinical pictures. We see these pictures day in and day out at our skin OPD. Uh, you know, the deformed, discolored nails, you know, flaking out and uh, chipping out. You know, these are the pictures that come often. And when you take a scraping of the nail or even a nail biopsy and, and uh, do a KOH mount preparation, you can see something like this if it is a pheoid fungus. Or you can see uh, in the LCB mount, you can see a picture like this, which is typical of trichophyton species. That is thin, delicate, filamentous, septate hyphae with small microconidias with typical arrangement along the hyphae on pedicles and some macroconidias may be observed. And this is the growth of the trichophyton on Sebros dextrosa. So this is a very common clinical picture to most of the mycologists throughout the world because dermatophytosis is prevalent throughout the world. It's really taking slow to you know shift to the slides, not on one click. I don't know why. Uh, so keratomycosis is another uh, superficial fungal infection. We have talked about it. Kerato means anything, the cornea here corneal infection, you can see the eyes are the most precious for all of us, isn't it? So we are all worried about its health. And whenever there is an ulcer, there is usually in agricultural workers, construction, uh, those engaged in construction activities, you know, small particles, dust particles, stone particles, or the, the plant uh, material can act as a splinter and it can enter the eye, it can damage the cornea, it can cause an ulcer and the patient comes with pain, redness, loss of vision, watering and all these things. So once he comes to the uh, clinician, he takes the corneal scrapping, he sends it to the lab. In the laboratory, we make a KOH mount preparation that is potassium hydroxide preparation, which is really very, very good in diagnosing. And uh, within 15 to 20 minutes, you can see uh, if it is present, if the fungi is present, you can see thin, delicate, you know, branching septate hyphae. And you can use a fluorescent stain like calcofloor white to see a highlighted view of the same. This is the same sample. See, in KOH, how it is looking and in calcofloor, how it is looking. So calcofloor is really very, very good uh, to identify the fungus. And so fusarium is a very common fungus isolated from the corneal ulcers. So it looks like this on a plate of SDA, you know, uh, salmon pink color, slight baby pink to salmon pink colored, fluffy, you know, feathery. And when you make a LCB mount of this, leptophenol cotton blue mount, it looks like this. Typical sickle shaped macroconidias. Then you can identify, you can clinch the diagnosis that it is fusarium. Aspergillus niger growing on an SDA tube, you know, white feathery colony with the black spores filling the tubes. And when you make a LCP mount, you will see high line septate branched, 
you know high fee at uh, branching on 90 degrees if a uh, yeast grows like candida albicans it will grow like this on an sda plate and on uh, gram stain it will look like a purple uh, spherical budding yeast and if it is say a phyoid fungus like alternaria alternata or something uh, carbularia then you will see a pigmented fungus when you make an koh mount or an lcb mount you will see the pigment brown and black pigment in the gonidias and in the hyphae wherein you can clinch the diagnosis that it is a pheoid fungus because pheoid fungi need a different sort of treatment so you have to differentiate whether it is hyaline or pheoid fungus so uh, the fungal infections of the ear again i'm i'm just skipping this uh, you know most of the aspergillus species can cause this infection because of the want of time i'm just skipping this prevalence of superficial and subcutaneous mycosis you will find very good maps on the net in the cdc uh, site also i think you can again go and see there i just want to highlight here that tinea capitis favors is widely prevalent and uh, chromoblastomycosis is also widely prevalent in India and in other Southeast Asian countries. So we need to really worry about this and, um, and uh, enable prompt diagnosis of these infections for effective management. Other sub the subcutaneous mycosis that are prevalent, not only in India, it applies to the whole Asia, are sporotrichosis, mycetoma, paraniasal sinus mycosis, chromoblastomycosis, pheohyphomycosis, entomophthora mycosis, and rhinosporidiosis, the ones that are highlighted in red you know, more prevalent here in Rajasthan, especially Ajmer. That's why I've highlighted it here. So the subcutaneous mycosis we have talked about, just see the clinical picture, you know, how disfiguring and, uh, you know, how unhealthy and uh, it's not really um, pacifying for the eyes, isn't it? So this is porotrichosis where, you know, you will see small papular ulcerator lesions along the lymphatic areas of the skin. Uh, it is widely prevalent in the in the Himachal Pradesh areas. It's not prevalent here in Rajasthan. I've not seen not not a one case I've seen. And you is uh, you know an elephant like leg or with draining sinuses. You know of ant hill appearance. Typically ant hill appearance. You will see in case of mycetoma and you will get grains from this sample and these grains can be crushed and stained. Wherein you can see a picture like this and you can diagnose it. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the the LCB mount preparation of sporotrichosis this, from the lesion. You can see typical, you know, uh, conidia arranged around the thin, delicate hyaline hyphae. Entomophthora mycosis is very prevalent in India and in the Southeast Asian countries, and uh, it's caused by Basidiobolus and Conidiobolus, two most common uh, agents. And uh, you, this is the typical microscopic feature of Basidiobolus with a beaked, you know, beaked conidias. And clinically, these are very, very disfiguring. I have an experience of Trichosporon luberi. This was the fourth case reported in the world at Arframar place at Ajmer. You can see this. This was a. It's a very interesting and a rewarding case because it was a female and uh, she was admitted to the surgical ward and then to the plastic surgery ward with you know multiple empirical treatments for more than a month, but it, the wound was not healing. Rather, it was progressing. And the sample we went. We were called, we went to the plastic surgery department, we collected the sample, we took a biopsy specimen and the cheesy, you know, secretions underneath these edges, and we grew trichosporon luberi from this, you know, very rare trichosporon. And uh, fluke, it was set, um, fortunately, it was uh, sensitive to fluconazole, the patient responded to the treatment, and within 20 days, the patient was uh, okay, and over a period of Three months the, the lesion healed like this you know this see the disfiguring here that leads to this one so definitely fungal diagnosis is important and it helps in the recovery of many people which is otherwise not possible that's what i want to highlight here subcutaneous mycosis are prevalent in asia and world over are chromoblastomycosis see the lesion here you know very dry you know scaly out of a lesion like this also it can come in initial stage and uh, you can see the copper pennies in the biopsy specimens and it grows like this it's caused most commonly by fonseca pedrosoid or it can also be caused by cladophyllophera bantiana it grows like this on sda and uh, microscopically it looks like this pheohyphomycosis is most commonly caused by cladophyllophora species pheohyphomycosis of the extremities of the body parts and of the scalp and the cns which is very very dangerous you know 
the mortality is high in these cases this is how it grows in culture you know dark colored colony with the black rivers and microscopically it looks like this so what i want to highlight here is the pattern of laboratory diagnosis remains the same whether it is uh, chromoblastomycosis, whether it's systemic mycosis, whether it's VOFR mycosis, whether it is uh, dermatophytosis, the pattern remains the same. You would diagnose it by the direct microscopy, staining, culture, and LCB mount and slide culture preparations. So this is the global distribution of chromoblastomycosis. Again, you can see that it is uh, clustered here in Southeast Asia also. They are highly prevalent, the red colored areas, you know, Fonseca petrosoi and Exophila species. These are highly clustered in the Southeast Asian countries. So we need to know about this, how to diagnose this uh, condition in the laboratory. Now coming to the systemic mycosis, we have already talked about the agents causing systemic mycosis. In addition, I would like to add that Sporothrix shenkai and Talleromyces marnifi. These are emerging systemic mycosis, especially in the Southeast Asian countries because of the increasing population of HIV and AIDS people. In these patients with uh, with a very poor immune uh, system and low CD4 counts, these fungi can proliferate very, very fast and present in different ways. So worldwide preference, uh, prevalence of systemic and subcutaneous mycosis, you can have a picture here that penicillosis, that is stelleromycosis and sporotrichosis is prevalent in the Southeast Asian countries, as also is blastomycosis and histoplasmosis. And uh, these are the regions with high burden of sporotrichosis. So we all need to know about all these fungal infections. Do I still have time? Hello, uh, Dr. Belly, should I, uh, should I continue or should I close up in another few minutes? Okay, I'm still waiting for the response. Madam, you can continue. Okay. Uh, and I uh, just want to tell you that I am manually changing the slides. Whenever you want to change the slides, you just tell me to change the slide. Oh, Next yeah, slide. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not able to see my screen. Yes. Yes. So this is histoplasmosis. You can see that up to 41% of the cases are seen in Asia, Asian countries. So definitely we cannot say that no we, we don't know how to diagnose this we need to know how it presents see how disfiguring it is it's ulcerative lesions on the skin ulcerating the mucus wherever the skin and the mucous membrane uh, you know the margins where they interact with each other where they join you get these lesions and this is how they grow on culture fluffy white colonies feathery colonies and uh, in the histopathological sections you can see this they are present within the macrophages in multiple numbers. Within the phagocytes, they are present. They are present intracellularly. And this is, this is how they grow on the tubes. And uh, microscopically, they look like this. That is thin, delicate, uh, septate filaments and giving rise to small microconidias, that is small spores, and the macroconidias, which are tuberculate, you know, rough and tuberculate with projections. This is very, very typical of histoplasmosis. So we need to uh, understand that these cases can be of histoplasmosis, and we need to take the samples appropriately and send to the lab uh, early for rapid and accurate diagnosis. So another systemic mycosis prevalent in uh, the Asian countries, especially the Southeast uh, Asian countries, Far Eastern countries, is blastomycosis. This is how, again, you know, ulceration along the nasal, the mucous membranes, wherever they are adjoining the skin areas. This is how they appear, usually the lesions. So you take a uh, biopsy or a, or a scrapping of this lesion and you send it to the laboratory. You stain it with gram stain, you will see like this, budding yeast. Or you can grow it in the media, that is the sabrot dextrose media, heart infusion agar if you want to convert it to the yeast form because it is dimorphic. This is the yeast form. And this is the mold form. And this is how the budding yeast will look like when narrow, narrow based, uh, or La blasto usually gives a broad based budding, uh, comparatively broader base. And uh, this is how they appear in the histological sections. So, diagnosis of these systemic infections follow a set pattern. Now, coming to the opportunistic fungal infections that are prevalent all over the world and in Asia. You can see here that candidiasis, cryptococcus, aspergillosis, mucormycosis. These are the top four opportunistic mycosis prevalent all 
uh, all over the world. In addition, I would like to say telluromycosis caused by telluromyces marnify, pneumocystis carinae pneumonia caused by pneumocystis carinae, pythiosis, pseudosporiosis, fusariosis, and trichosporonosis. They are also opportunistic infections, especially in the context of the Southeast Asian countries, because here the HIV AIDS population is clustered. You know, and these populations are more prone to these infections. So more cases are being seen in these regions. Yes, next slide, please. Yes, candidiasis. So you can see that candida can affect any part of the body, any part of the body. In When we study microbiology, we classically learn that, you know, amoebiasis can present with any symptom. Amoebiasis can affect any part of the body. It is caused by entamoeba astrolithica. Same way, candidiasis can affect any part of the body. And it can cause any such symptom. So anything that is not commonly diagnosed, even after giving appropriate antibiotics or antiprotozoals, you can always go for diagnosis of candida. And usually it comes out to be positive. Oropharyngeal infections, it can cause oropharyngeal candidiasis, systemic candidiasis, vulvovaginal candidiasis, that is the, uh, the genital tract of the females, mucocutaneous candidiasis, mainly involving the feet. And uh, in the oral cavity, they can cause thrush. In the gastrointestinal tract, it can cause diarrhea and other symptoms. Genital tract, we've already talked about where it causes usually vulvovaginal candidiasis. Apart from this, it can also, in the systemic candidiasis, it can if in, infect the, um, the kidney and the ureters and causing UTI. Or it can affect the endocardium. Endocardium is a, a sort of a, you can say, envelope around the uh, the muscle mass of the heart this is called uh, inside the muscle mass lining the muscle mass inside the heart that comes into contact with blood and when it is inflamed it is called as endocarditis and uh, candidiasis is a common cause of endocarditis it causes hematogenous infection so any blood infection which is not responding to antibacterials you should always suspect that it can be due to candidiasis and you should take the blood sample appropriately and culture it in the laboratory. See, uh, skin candidiasis of the skin and mucous membrane is very, very common. This is a picture of oral thrush, wherein a white pseudomembrane forms all over the tongue and the tonsils and the foci. That is uh, the entrance to our elementary tract. So this will all be infected with the patch. And when you try to peel out the patch, a red oozing area comes. So this is very typical of oral thrush caused by candida. Candida can also cause uh, infections of the of the skin, especially in the interdigital spaces, and they get macerated and inflamed, and it is very, very painful. This is candidiasis presenting in the form of small papular lesions on the foot. So these are some of the forms of uh, skin and mucous membrane candidiasis. Candida infections are very, very common in a lab, in a hospital setting because of various reasons, which we have already highlighted. So here it also favors emergence of drug resistant species. And in fact, candida orders emergence in the hospitals has been a very serious threat these days. And uh, mycologists world over and clinicians are you know, struggling to combat this infection. This is how the candida looks like in a direct microscopy of the sputum wherein you can see this is the epithelial cell and this is the yeast that is present spherical yeast small round yeast in the gram stain so it's a very simple tool by which you can diagnose and it can be seen in the blood also within the blood cells you know bloodstream candidiasis it is seen small spherical oval yeast within the blood cells also this is Budding yeast and pseudohyphae that is classically seen whenever uh, you know candida infection is tremendous in any part of the body. When you culture it on media like Sabaros dextrose agar over 24 to 48 hours, within 24 to 48 hours, you get a growth like this, you know, white, creamy, pasty, shiny colonies. It also grows on blood agar medium, which is a common medium used in microbiology, especially bacteriology. You know, whenever we want to diagnose bacterial infection, we inoculate it on blood agar. So uh, usually, you never know now what is happening with the patient, you know, whether he is suffering from bacterial, fungal, viral, or protozoal. So, we keep an array of medias of which, say, we use SDA for fungi, we keep blood agar for the bacteria. Uh, so, this is how we inoculate, and it grows on these medias also, like this, you know, gray colored, uh, shiny, moist colonies on blood agar, which, and when you make a gram stain, it will give this picture. 
you have special medias which we have talked about earlier also the chrome agar candida wherein the species of candida depending on that it will give a colored colony that will give a clue to the species of the is yes, next please species of the candida so candida or as i told you it is uh, you know spreading like a wild forest fire all over the world causing much uh, you know much um, it is a dreaded disease because uh, it is associated with the healthcare stays in uh, most of the developed countries as well next slide please so cryptococcus is another opportunistic infection prevalent world over and especially in the southeast asian countries uh, and it is uh, it is an indicator disease even in aids it is an indicator disease for people living with hiv aids whenever a case comes with crypt of cryptococcus comes to you you may suspect that yes the patient may be it may be uh, suffering from aids also so it is coexistent and so is it coexistent with tuberculosis also usually it presents as a pulmonary lesion pulmonary means related to the lung lung lesions where opacities are formed you know x ray picture showing this and this is the histopathological section showing budding yeasts within the budding yeasts within the tissues again these are histopathological pictures this is how you can diagnose it by a simple technique that is nigrosin or the indian preparation that i already highlighted in my earlier slides it takes just 10 minutes to prepare and see this if you see a capsulated budding yeast like this is the yeast and this is the capsule the halo you are seeing is the capsule around it and if you see this picture there is no other diagnosis but it is cryptococcus pneumococcus you can straight away say that this is a cryptococcal meningitis or cryptococcal other infection cryptococcus of the skin and see the skin lesions cryptococcus this is very very common in hiv and aids patients if you go to an hiv aids clinic you will see many patients coming with presentations like this and if a sample is taken from here sent to the laboratory you see an indian preparation showing this picture you see a histopathological uh, as you know picture like this or an x ray radiography like this then the diagnosis is very simple it's clinched and appropriate treatment can be instituted next slide please Yes, culture. So uh, I want to highlight cryptococcus because it is a very, very, very rapidly proliferating disease in these days of HIV/AIDS in the Southeast Asian countries, and WHO has included it under the, you know, high alert uh, diseases of uh, fungal diseases also. So you need to know everything about it. Culture. So on Sagros dextros agar, see the typical pasty mucoid colonies, white colonies, but they can turn orange tan also or brown on prolonged incubation because of its metabolites that are produced special agars like bird seed agar this is the bird seed agar wherein you get a brown colored colony of cryptococcus neoformans canavanin glycine bromothymol blue agar you can use wherein uh, the getai will form blue colored colonies so uh, this is how you can differentiate uh, the species of cryptococcus also the samples that are received in the laboratory are usually the cerebrospinal fluid blood sputum and the skin biopsy in csf in meningitis 75% to 90% of cases turn out to be cryptococcal in these days of next slide please in these days of uh, hiv aids and also the who recommends that uh, all hiv patients with a cd4 count cd4 count is a t lymphocyte particular type of a t lymphocyte an immune immune cell that is present in the body in the blood when the level goes below 100 all such hiv patients should be tested for cryptococcal antigen because when it goes below 100 the cryptococcal antigen almost invariably comes positive means the patient is suffering from cryptococcal infection and for this you have uh, certain serological tests for uh, rapid diagnosis you can go for an lfa test or you can go for the imi cryptococcal antigen lfa test which is very very useful so it is a point of care test the lateral flow assay and uh, of the imi is you know recommended by the who uh, to be done on any patient with a next slide any patient with a cd4 count less than 100 so in these era of increasing emerging re emerging you know infections we need to know the tools to diagnose uh, at the earliest possible so that appropriate management can be instituted another opportunistic uh, fungal infection we have dealt with candidiasis and cryptococcus another one most prevalent one is aspergillosis uh, if you go back and research you know uh, aspergillus was there even before any life appeared on the earth you know the spores of aspergillus you can find even in the space ships 
this is what is said so it is a very old um, old body now becoming more pathogenic because you know we are not uh, concerned about them we are rather intruding into their niches so it has turned very uh, defensive and um, yes so aspergillosis uh, the various clinical presentation forms are bronchopulmonary aspergillosis means the lungs are affected chronic necrotizing aspergillosis of the lung where the lung gets destroyed you know it's it's reduced into a dead matter that is what necrotizing means ocular aspergillosis means aspergillosis of the eye it's also very very common and acute invasive pulmonary aspergillosis where is it the onset is very very acute means very rapid so this is aspergillosis of the uh, sinus this is the view from the buccal cavity so the maxillary sinus lies just above the heart palate so this is an infection of the sinus so it's all very related this area is very sensitive we all know this the head and the neck you know many systems the brain the, the digestive systems the entrance to the digestive system you know and the, the nasal cavities you know they are uh, the intermediary between these two so these are very sensitive areas and whenever an infection happens here you know the, the life becomes very pitiable for the patient so you need to know that these things occur and how we can prevent it i'm not going into the details of its cultural and mor morphology because we've already uh, talked about it but just see the typical picture of aspergillus it got its name from aspergillum literally meaning you've seen aspergillum uh, especially in the south i've seen uh, so uh, whenever you go to an auspicious function they you know just sprinkle that rose water on you with something with a small uh, round thing with a long handle sort of a thing which is called as an aspergillum and because the morphology resembles this resembles this you know that is why it has got its name as aspergillus so this is something interesting next slide please allergic fungal rhinosinusitis see this is the sinus cavity where an endoscope has been inserted you can see the mass growing here and the blackish areas these are all aspergillus spores and in the uh, ct mri scans you will see that uh, the sinuses are all you know these are all these are all blocked the sinuses blocked there is a mass extending here and again these are endoscopic uh, features of the inferior turbinate of the nose in, when you insert an endoscope into the nose you can see the turbinates inflamed growth aspergillus colony growing inside so so these are very troublesome chronic headache you know feeling dull all the time and uh, and not able to concentrate you know these are all common symptoms these days isn't it but if it becomes chronic and plus the patient has allergy he has a tendency to sneeze and all these things you have to be very very careful to cleanse the toxins from these sinuses and the nose because if it remains there it can grow and it can flourish when there is a dip in the immune system of the individual at some point of time and then it can lead to severe complications because of its proximity to the brain so whenever these symptoms occur you should uh, suggest that the patient goes to the ENT specialist get the nose and the paranasal sinuses checked and if any growth or any abnormality is seen it should be uh, appropriately investigated next slide please yes zygomycosis is another opportunistic infection also called as you can call it as mucormycosis nowadays especially after the post covid era where we have seen much cases of mucormycosis i need not go much into detail i'm sure you must be knowing many about it but the commonest presentation is the rhinocerebral form wherein the orbital areas the eye areas the nose and the proximity to the brain these all these areas are involved in mucormycosis and it spreads so very fast within 24 hours death can happen because it spreads by the blood route the 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 spores and the filaments they gain entry into the blood and immediately they reach the brain and once it reaches brain it uh, rapidly proliferates and it can lead to death so it has to be diagnosed very very fast and uh, this is the typical uh, rhizopus that we have isolated in plenty during the covid uh, mucormycosis uh, outbreak many cases of rhizopus associated uh, mucormycosis we have diagnosed and this is uh, this is how the you can observe micromorphology this is typical of epiphysomyces elegans another zygomycete next slide please teleromycosis this is the comparatively newer newer term earlier it was called as penicillosis magnifi now it is called as teleromycosis and uh, the taxonomy has changed 
See, this, this is again a very common feature. I'm sure some of you must have seen this at your place if you're from the Southeast Asian countries, especially because it's very common in the HIV population, HIV AIDS uh, positive patients, you know, skin lesions like this. Whenever you see a case like this, th the first thing that should come to your mind is, yes, maybe this is a fungal infection due to Tyleromyces marner 5. See the prevalence here? It is all clustered in the eastern parts and some parts of the north uh, northern eastern parts of India and the whole of the Far East and the Southeast Asia is afflicted because of this infection. And uh, when you grow it, when the sample is sent, the skin sample, the biopsy sample will be sent. It is grown on SDA medium. You will see a growth like this, you know, growing like a filamentous fungi. And later on, uh, it, it can grow as a filamentous fungi, but it will convert to the yeast form when it is incubated at 37 degrees centigrade. So it is also a dimorphic yeast. Or if you take the blood sample of the patient, you can see plenty of budding yeast cells within the macrophages. Macrophages, you can see it here. These are blood cells. This is the RBC you are seeing here, right side. And this blue cell, this is the macrophage blood cell that is present, WBC, white blood cell. Within this, you can see multiple budding yeast. So this suggests that it is it is Saleromyces marnify along with the clinical presentation, of course. And micromorphology, I, 37 degrees centigrade, it will grow like a filament like this and uh, it will grow like an yeast when it is incubated at 37 degrees centigrade. You know, the fission. And it does not reproduce by budding. You know, this is something unique to this. It reproduces by fission. You can see the fission here, the septa here. It will reproduce by simple fission. So this is about, next slide please, about aleromycosis. Yes, this is again, previous slide. Next slide, sorry. Yes, so there are many fungi with outbreak potential. Uh, you must all be knowing if you, uh, we really don't want to concentrate and focus on, you know, what is happening in the microbial world and the disease world. But being doctors and mycologists, we are helpless. We need to pay a little focus on this to know what is happening and how we can be helpful to the population. Uh, in reducing their, uh, you know, uh, the morbidity and their mortality. If you visit the sites like CDC, it keeps on giving alerts. So this outbreak has happened in this part of the world. The reason the outbreak was of uh, the sporotrichosis in Brazil. Another uh, outbreak or probably a uh, prosodemic is happening is of uh, the drug-resistant dermatophytosis, especially in India and Asian countries, caused by the uh, trichophyton indoni. Other fungi of outbreak potential candida orders we have already seen. You know, it is uh, very uh, notorious to cause outbreaks in hospital settings, especially ICUs. And uh, probably it is all driven by the climate change also. As all resistant Aspergillus fumigators is again a problem. And this is probably, it is, you know, why uh, there is a misconception that it, all the resistance that is happening in microbes, including the fungus, is because of improper, irrational use by the medical professionals, the doctors. No, it's not so. Yes, there is an element of, you know, uh, unethical and uh, irrational use of this, but it's not that big an issue as it is in the agricultural and the environmental sector, where antifungals are used in plants, in soil, to kill the microbes, to increase the production, to improve in packaging. They are all used widely in these sectors, which is contributing maximally to the emergence of drug resistant strains. So we need to concentrate there. It's a very difficult situation to collaborate with people outside your field, isn't it? But it is our moral responsibility to take it there and address it there also. And in fact, my interest of uh, giving this talk in MycoAsia Forum was also because of this, because I know here that non-medical people are also uh, interested in learning these things. And without your contribution and without your increase in knowledge and execution at the grassroots level, this uh, fungal uh, infection, you know, the you can call it as an outbreak, an epidemic, a prosodemic, a pandemic, this is not going to be controlled at all. No policies. No amount of funding will bring a reduction in the outbreaks and the emergence of drug resistance strains if the morals and ethics are not practiced. And to practice morals and ethics, first you need to have the knowledge of what morals and ethics in your sector is. What to use and what not to use and why not to use. We all need to know and we all need to tell our fellow people of uh, you know different sectors, say the agriculturalists. 
the farmers, the cattle rearers, the dairy producers, industrialists. We need to take in, you know, loop in all of them and tell them, give a session to them. Please don't do this. You are putting your uh, health at stake and also the health of the world at stake. You know, this is this has to happen. Cryptic species of Aspergillus um, lentulus is also causing outbreaks here and there. Mucorails, we have already seen post-COVID and COVID-associated mucormycosis. Uh, Resamsonia uh, argillaceae is also said to develop antifungal resistance. This is a penicillium-related species, and it is causing uh, antifungal resistant strains induced outbreaks. And we have already talked about amidophytosis caused by trichophyton endotini in India. And again, I want to highlight here that what is happening in India is because of the overuse, misuse, you know, over-the-counter availability of drugs and misuse by the general population of fixed drug combination, fixed, do fixed dose applications or combinations, wherein steroids and antifungals are present in combination in tubes. You know, everybody wants to go to the pharmacy. Why should we go wait in a line to meet a doctor, take an appointment? You know, nobody wants to take all this pain. They just go to the pharmacist. You will ask the pharmacist, is there anything to treat my skin infection, dermatophytosis? He will say, yes, I have a very good tube, you see, very colorful one, very jazzy one. He will give you the tube and you will apply it and you will see that within a day there is no inflammation. That is because it is having steroid. But you don't know the knowledge behind it. And, you know, it is a cryptic thing that uh, it is going to harm your skin and it is going to make the strain more resistant if you are going to use fixed drug combinations. And then it leads to emergence of drug resistant strains like trichophyton, indotini. Now you have no drug to control this. Now, which pharmacist are we going to go to control this? So, you know, we all look at the situation by, you know, uh, not appropriately um, informing ourselves of the implications of what we do. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So this was, you know, this was all in the media. We all know this. Uh, one day it is a black fungus. One day it is a yellow fungus. One day it is a blue fungus. And what not was going on. It was all a misnomer. After today's session, at least I hope that all those who have attended will be sure to know that there is no term as a black fungus. And if at all you want to say black fungus, it means a pigmented fungus, a pheoid fungus, which is different from the highline fungus. And mucormycosis was definitely not caused by a black fungus. It was caused by a hyaline fungus belonging to the order mucorails, and it was called as mucormycosis. So I think certain misnomers and uh, you know misconceptions need to be removed from the society. And definitely, we don't want to see. Next slide, please. We don't want to see such cases again. Uh, thankfully, in the last two years, there has been uh, not much reports of mucormycosis associated with COVID or otherwise. But during the COVID epidemic, we came to know by various research that it is due to the steroid use, zinc supplementation, and uncontrolled diabetes, which acted as the risk factors for their increased incidence of these. But we still know what else was also responsible. Next slide, please. So to summarize and to conclude, um, I thank you all for your patient listening. But uh, to conclude today's session, what we have learned, the fungal infections are rapidly increasing. I think we got it clear that it is no longer, you know, um, we cannot just brush away or neglect it. We need to address this issue, issue that fungal infections are increasing because of the reasons we have talked about. The infections that are very common in uh, Asia and, of course, world over also, it is candidiasis, cryptococcus, aspergillosis, Taleromycosis, sporotrichosis, dermatophytosis, mucormycosis, pythiosis, histoplasmosis. Out of these, you can pick histoplasmosis as a dimorphic fungi, and so is taleromycosis caused by penicillium marnifi, and so is sporotrichosis caused by sporotrich shenkai. Apart from this, most are opportunistic fungi, that is, candidiasis, cryptococcus, aspergillosis, mucormycosis. These are all Pythiosis. These are all opportunistic fungal infections. Means otherwise they don't cause disease. Only when the human immunity goes very, very low, they cause this. Dermatophytosis is prevalent even in otherwise healthy individuals. And much research is going on as to why this is increasing. So not to comment much on this. Rapid development of antifungal resistance in the um, fungal species is becoming more troublesome. Prevention of antifungal resistance requires antifungal stewardship. The CDC, the CDC is uh, working on this, but as responsible citizens and mycologists, 
uh, we need to know the intricacies and uh, try to prevent emergence of this resistance. This will require intersectoral cooperation. As I told you, we need to communicate with our fellows in the agricultural side and in the industrial side and in the dairy, dairy workers, the packagers, in all these, uh, we need to uh, collaborate with them. The laboratory diagnosis, definitely we have understood that it is a must. Otherwise, we will not be able to clinically diagnose infections based on clinical signs and symptoms. We definitely need to strengthen the laboratories in the Asian countries uh, or wherever we are you know, working. We need to strengthen our laboratories and our acumen to diagnose rapidly and timely all these fungal infections. Early initiation of specific antifungal therapy is a must if you want to save the patient and reduce the mor morbidity. Antifungal susceptibility testing and therapeutic monitoring is of use for the clinicians to handle the cases effectively, especially in hospitalized cases. Epidemiological surveillance, uh, you know, the, for this also laboratory diagnosis is a must. Otherwise, we never will come to know what is emerging, what will happen the next time, how we will control it. You know, this is uh, surveillance is an ongoing activity. Etiological identification of emergent diseases you know, the, for this also laboratory uh, strengthening and the diagnostic procedures, this must be strengthened to tackle any emergent situation and identify it. Our outbreak management, of course, involves source identification and the etiological identification for which laboratory diagnosis is a must. Next slide, please. So to conclude, finally, this is what we have learned. I think this is what you will take home today that Microscopy, culture, and histopathology are standard methods, and antigen antibody detection and serological detection methods are available. X ray, CT, and MRI, that is, imaging techniques, are also helpful in diagnosing infection, especially in case of mucormycosis, aspergillosis of the lung, etc. Molecular identification methods are more, more and more preferred because of their rapidity and their specificity and sensitivity. And uh, of course, the only uh, impeding factor may be the cost in the resource poor settings. Next slide, please. So, but really I want uh, I want to utilize the time and the, uh, the lecture opportunity given to me today in giving you the take home message. The take home message is not just that the fungal infections are increasing, laboratory diagnostic methods that you need to know, how to strengthen your laboratories. Apart from that, the take home message, most important message is, is my health is my responsibility, isn't it? If you are healthy, then you will be able to uh, be uh, think about others' health and to improve uh, the health of a sick person, isn't it? If you are yourself sick, you are yourself unhealthy, you are yourself promoting unhealthy practices. I think all this, uh, uh, you know, laboratory diagnosis and all this workup, I think it becomes meaningless. And I want to highlight, especially to the young population watching this lecture today, that Please take home this message that we need to be very mindful in our living. We need to sync our activities with the natural cycle. The circadian rhythm, we all know in medical terminology that we have a circadian rhythm. The thyroid stimulating hormone is highest at between 2 to 4 a.m. in the morning, lowest at 5 to 6. You know, we talk about this. But something more is happening. It's not just you're not able to see something. It means that it is not there. Some higher vibrational things are happening in the cosmos and you need to sync with it. And our age-old Ayurveda tells the same thing, that daily rhythm occurs in the human body and it has to be synced with the rhythm of the nature. And look, that the time till, uh, till the time that we do this, I think we are going to just beat around the bushes, around the fungal infections, bacterial infections, viral infections, and getting nowhere. Health is a far-fetched concept if we are not going to address it at the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is that we are not sinking with nature, we are not living with nature, we are not mindful, we are not, uh, um, I'll talk about thoughts and emotions probably in some other lecture, which, which play a very important role in keeping you healthy. Without addressing these things, no amount of microscopy, no amount of cultural methods, no amount of molecular methods, no amount of imaging techniques or antifungal drugs or the hospitals can bring health home to you. I think this message I really want to deliver to the audience that we need to sync with nature. You can see it very clearly from here. You can uh, see it in the net also uh, by the name of Ayurvedic Daily Rhythm. Just see, I just want to highlight here, just see, six, uh, it's between, between 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. is the best waking up time. 
When, when are we all waking up these days, especially the youngsters? Not before 8? Not before 10? I don't know. So, so when you're supposed to wake up, you're sleeping. And when you're supposed to be eating uh, the heaviest meal, that is between uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., you're supposed to eat the heaviest meal, somewhere around 12 noon to 2 p.m. But when are we eating? All the day, at the night, after 10 p.m.? So we are not syncing with the nature and this is creating a disturbance in our body and in turn it is favoring uh, it is lowering the immunity and it is favoring the growth of microorganisms which have ecological niches outside the body we are rather inviting them okay come to me okay i want to eat after 10 pm please come to come inside me and you can stay here for some time and uh, you can cause disease no it's like something we are inviting diseases deliberately so we need to take care of when to when to wake up, when to eat, when to work, when to socialize, when to assimilate and slow down. That is after 6 p.m. we need to slow down. But most of the time we are all waking up with the internet and parties and you know socializing after 9 p.m. So this is all disturbing our uh, body rhythm and it is leading to n number of diseases, not just fungal diseases, n number of diseases. So till the time we correct our schedules, our natural rhythm, I think, I think any amount of blah, blah, blah is not going to work out. It's not going to give you health. Of course, it will know, give you knowledge about disease and uh, certain tools to tackle the disease, but never the health. And let us also be mindful about thoughts and emotions. I'm looking forward to taking an entirely separate topic on influence of thoughts and emotion in diseases sometime later, maybe in mycology also. Next slide, please. So what do we want? Do we really want to stay in this planet and looking after the white fungus, the yellow fungus, the black fungus, the colors of the fungus? Next one, please. Or as mycologists, we just want to, you know, accept our defeat and we want to go away from this planet. Or we want to look into the colors of this planet, the colors, the natural colors of the rainbows, enjoy the colors. If the option is up to us, the choice is up to us. So with this, I say a big thank you to all of you for your patient listening. I hope the session was useful and uh, the carry home message was also clear and I, and it will make your lives better. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, giving all thank of us uh, such an important take home message. Uh, we'll definitely uh, bring changes in our daily routine. Now uh, we are heading towards the question and answer session and uh, whoever wants to ask their questions, please can ask them, ma'am. Uh, Madam uh, Dr. Rastagi, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and uh, thank you, sir. the kind of energy and enthusiasm we have shown like for last two hours, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for your efforts. Uh, my, my, my question is, you know, when I was a PhD, I mean, student of fungal taxonomy, I was new to the field and I would uh, mostly go to the genus level. But my PhD advisor would say there is a different level of understanding when you go to the species level. Okay. So I, I want to know how important in medical mycology to go to the species level of the disease causing fungi. You know, when the number of antifungal agents is quite limited, do we really need to go to the species level, whether the understanding up to genus level would be sufficient uh see it's a very good question thank you for that i think at some stage in my in my career as a budding mycologist i got through the same uh, process of you know asking myself why all this taxonomy why all this taxonomic change why do we need to know about the names of changing names all the time you know strains and all but yes uh, uh scientifically speaking logically speaking i think it is a must because uh, as i told you certain species candida cruzi for example is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole now imagine someone say someone from my family or your family admitted in a hospital and uh, a blood sample is taken out and uh, a, and this sample is processed and the doctor has given a mycologist has given a report that candida cruzi has grown on culture and again, imagine that the day the blood was drawn, the patient, uh, our the family member is hospitalized for say now seven days in the hospital. You can imagine the turmoil that is happening in your family. And uh, till seven days, empiric treatment was given with fluconazole. Okay, as it is a standard in any IC. On the eighth day, the report arrives that the isolate is Candida cruzi, and it is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole. 
would you still like to give fluconazole i think definitely not you would like to go for that posaconazole or amphotericin the other alternatives because you want to save your near and dear one so when it comes to saving an uh, your near and dear one i think yes species identification is important because it has its uh, a uh, set pattern of antifungal susceptibilities and other characteristics that really helps in recovery of the patient but yes as an academician i might really find it a burden to you know go through all this process of different 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 species different strains their characteristics you know this is urease positive this is uh, fluconazole resistant and what not all these features but whenever it has a treatment implication that will Uh, influence the recovery of the patient yes species identification is important so we will have to go with the uh, scientific world and the advancements uh, so that one day if we are facing any such situation we will be able to tackle it in a better way i think uh, that answers the question i know thank it's very troublesome thank you for that uh, we will discuss about it further some other time that's my second question is that yes. i was i was affected by covid during the second wave Okay. But I did not get uh, mucormycosis. But uh, there were some ten thousand people. I mean, five thousand people uh, lost their lives because of mucormycosis. What yeah. had happened with them? Yes, as we had, uh, you know, discussed in the uh, this lecture. I think uh, everybody had got it right that it all depends on how your immunity is. Fine, and the immunity has various uh, variable correlates. Immunity is not just one thing. If I eat a good meal, I am immune to things. It's not like that. i have to, i that's why i showed that biological rhythm uh, that what i understand it is my perception that to have a good immunity you have to follow the uh, nature's rhythm along with a good diet along with the high level and good quality thoughts and emotions and these are all uh, you know the intricacies that we usually don't touch upon uh, in uh, when we talk about uh, you know medical field that is allopathy we don't talk about all these things otherwise it's not in the books at all in allopathy so we think that it, these are all not important but looking to the same set of people say 10 person uh, who have uh, suffered from covid like you also said you suffered from covid you were i don't know what uh, environment you were in suppose a patient uh, of a so low socio economic uh, condition who is you know bread and butter for whom bread and butter earning is also very difficult if he gets a covid covid he, he turns out to be covid positive and he is say a fruit seller on the road fruit vendor on the road and is exposed to all the polluted air on the road and the soil which he is not handling properly then he is you know knowingly or unknowingly putting all those risk factors into his body and especially being covid positive these things can introduce the mucor into the body and it can lead to mucormycosis so uh, in ayurveda we speak of i think many of your people here are hindi speaking also in ayurveda we say aachar vichar aahar vihar so it is for sure that you are achar vichar ahar vihar was at about 90% that's why you you know escaped you know uh, suffering from any such illness whereas some poor people who are not aware of all these things achar vichar ahar vihar achar means the whole character how you think how you move about the lifestyle vichar means your thoughts and vihar means how you communicate where you go like i don't wash my hands suppose after uh, you know working in the lab then i'm making myself at risk for infections i have to wash it thoroughly i cannot say the water is not coming in the tap i have to find a way wherein i will find clean water to wash my hands see you know these are the little uh, small practices or you can say the lifestyle behaviors that will help you uh, prevent acquiring infections and then what happens finally will depend upon your thoughts and emotions also so this is what i have understood in my uh, journey as a mycologist and as a doctor and a researcher i think um, yeah the third one ma'am if yes. i yeah my, i mean as a, as a, as as somebody who has to make a decision not maybe not decision probably you have to be conscious yes how to balance between the money you have to pay for the diagnosis versus the affordability of the patient you know in india we do not have uh, you know health insurance for at least in the opd system like how do you manage that actually uh from rajasthan at ajmer we are lucky that uh, here mukhya mantri nishulk janch yojana and mukhya mantri nishulk dawa vitran yojana means free uh, laboratory diagnosis and free drug disbursal this scheme is already there in rajasthan so here uh, we don't face that much of a problem 
even if you don't have an otherwise insurance government or a private insurance but yes for of course the states and other places where the schemes are not available i think uh, we need to come up with something uh, as a bank or something which will which can fund uh, the very critical patients i think many of the hospitals also have they have funding agencies for such uh, you know poor and economically weaker section people when they are admitted with a critically con uh, critical condition certain things are made free for them through that like bamasha yojana is there in rajasthan so any anybody who gets registered in the bamasha yojana his treatment and the cost in the hospital will be made free so i believe certain such policies can be uh, brought about in other states if it is not already there i'm not aware actually about the other states what's happening uh what sort of policies are there we need to bring about because when it comes to a critically ill patient as a doctor we really want to only save the patient so money should not come in between so the best thing has to go to everybody irrespective of the social condition economic condition of the patient the rich will always uh, find ways to you know uh, mobilize the drugs but for the poor we need to still develop a structure and to develop a structure first you need to have that intention i think that is missing you you will create policies but you don't have the intention i think they don't work out at the execution level they get lost away so uh, that is why you know mindful practices have to be incorporated by everybody so it's a long process but in the immediate run i think uh, we need to check even i will go and check today you know what are the options available for such patients critically ill patients when they need uh, such costly laboratory diagnosis and treatment i will also find out the motivation behind asking that that, that third question was when vinay was giving the presentation he was mentioning that uh, amphotericin treatment will cost you in lakhs yes 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 yes, yes. so therefore 35000 per day Yes, uh, because the production of amphotericin is also very expensive affair. You know, so it is. It has got uh, some chemical process. Anyway, I I have many questions to ask you. I will ask some other time. Thank yes. you very much. I will let others to ask the questions now. Romi. Yes, sir. Dear participants, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. I think there are uh, much more questions in the message section. Uh, should i see that yes yes ma'am you can read out to me i just a second i'm uh, trying to assess that chat with everyone is it on the chat yes any questions i think it's better to call out uh, rather than me uh, ma'am should we give antifungal to newborn in which non albicans candida isolated in blood culture yes yes non candida albicans are more troublesome these days compared to even candida albicans because they are more uh, prone to drug resistance and you will have to give uh, the antifungal depending upon the species identification in the laboratory that will be better otherwise you can go for boriconazole which usually gives responses in invasive candida infections echinocandidans are preferred invasive fungal infections due to candida Yeah, echinocandidans like caspar fungin is pre is uh, preferred so according to uh, the exact diagnosis the age of the patient the other risk factors say, like say suppose a per person is uh, already having a kidney damage or kidney function is very low there is no fun in giving amphotericin because amphotericin is highly toxic to the renal system it is nephrotoxic so you will have to uh, select the appropriate choice of antifungal depending upon various variables which will be different for each patient the age the sex their socio economic status the underlying medical condition associated risk factors plus the affordability you know all this plus the and most importantly the species that is isolated and its antifungal susceptibility so these will all together decide what sort of uh, uh, treatment has to be given uh, i think this was a one question i could see here and uh, uh, i think everybody is unmuted by the host Yes, ma'am. They are unmuted. Okay, so so do I presume that there are no questions, or if you can read some no, questions to me? Uh, Romi, let me call out people. Anjali Sona, do you have a question? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, Miss Sakshi Sharma has asked a question, ma'am. How can we overcome the resistance developed by fungi in crops? even the transgenic ones are developing resistant after some time now yes it is a very very burning question very relevant question as i told you 
uh, it's not because of irrational prescribing by doctors or uh, over the counter drugs and um, unnecessary medication by the patients which is a big problem the even more bigger problem is the uh, irrational use of antifungals in agriculture in the crops and in the cattle you know the milk that we are drinking is it really milk i still wonder try to find out something in the laboratory the milk that is uh, you know uh, the obtained by milking of a uh, desi cow what you call call it as and a cow that is being fed with hormones to increase production that is injected with hormones that is given a cattle feed that consists of antibacterials and antifungals it's a very interesting research study to pick up i think phd's should take up such topics of relevance currently you will find a drastic difference i'm sure you will find some difference in the property of the milk also and it it will have to be on a, a long term because uh, certain chronic ill effects come over the time they don't manifest immediately so uh, how to overcome the resistance developed by fungi in the crops it's a you know it will be a long term uh, goal actually it will be an ongoing process you need to change the practices you need to put effective control just policy making is not enough i think in india and world over policies uh, many policies are made research funding is given for all those things many meetings are uh, done on different platforms but it is not seeping at the ground level so we need to conduct uh, iec activities like this one um, uh, we can take it up with the uh, lay persons also we need to educate them we need to tell why it is important if we can go to the farmer's house or the farm and we can tell them scientifically with evidence we can make up a small ppt for them and show them you see if you are putting antifungals in the crops this will be the yield this will go to the intestines of people and including people in your family also how long will you preserve something very pure for your family it will come in many ways you may be a guest at somebody's place and they will be offering something which was packeted and that packeted will contain some antifungal isn't it you can you have to explain it in real term if we can educate people and touch their hearts i think i still believe if you can educate and touch the hearts of people with a pure intention things will change over the time over the time not immediately not immediately because it's influenced by the government policies plus we need to take up discussions with the policy makers also at the government level and tell them you know how we can uh, together bring about this change so it is a very relevant question but difficult also to uh, execute but yet it is not impossible i think where there is a will there is a way if we stay committed i think uh, the way comes out so we need to stay committed to the uh, goal and we need to work on this and you should really take up such scientific research on such relevant topics rather than just mundane you know working out this sequencing that molecular sequencing yes, this is it has an importance but if you can link it with something a burning issue a practical issue like the question you are asked pick up the crops where you know which have been fertilized with uh, something that contains antifungals also pick up and isolate fungi from them see what is happening what sort of resistance is occurring and show it to the farmers ki this fungi is isolated from your crops and this fungi is isolated from crops that are grown using natural methods that is uh, we call it as prakritik kheti isn't it uh, so we we can come make a study comparing these two things and we can show it to the farmers at the local level at the authoritative level at the policy making level at the government level this is how we can contribute nobody can change anyone in this world if you can change somebody it is your own self and when you change definitely the um, the change comes around you and i think that is the small world uh, that matters to you if changes can uh, changes for the betterment of people can come around you i think uh, you are already successful i think that addresses the question um Bala Khan is having a question. Yes, please. Uh, how to make balance between research and diagnosis of fungal infection? Uh, for this, I would like to know from what background this person is coming. What do you mean by a balance between research and uh, research and what? And diagnosis. Diagnosis of fungal infection. That will depend upon your role, isn't it? See, I am a taking my own example i am a professor and a head of microbiology department so i have some administrative roles and since i am a professor i have academic roles and since again i am a professor i have researching roles and since i am a teacher doctor teacher also i have teaching roles and plus since i am a diagnostic uh, person so i have 
diagnostic uh, roles also commitment to the um, to the patient so i have to divide my energy my time my efforts under all the sections depending upon which is more important prioritize prioritize suppose uh, um, suppose i am heading the i am heading the mycology department my, uh, mycology section of my department suppose a sample has come from a critical uh, scenario from a patient in the icu and they want me to identify the fungus as soon as possible there is no fun in you know giving attending a conference at that time or uh, taking a class for an mbbs student at that time when a critical sample arrives in my laboratory so at that moment my priority will be to first process the sample and identify the causative agent report the fungus to the clinician so that the patient can receive the best possible treatment even if i have to skip one of my lectures to my students even if i have to skip one uh, any researching um, uh, commitment on that day i will skip that because my first priority is as a doctor only then i am a researcher so i will always uh, give uh, preference to diagnostic work first and the research second and uh, since I am a medical teacher, I have to distribute between teaching and researching efforts equally. And administrative, I manage uh, as I do all these things. So it's all about you know understanding the need of the situation, what is more important, and prioritize your uh, energies. I think that's it. I that answers. And if you want to say which is more important, I'll say lab diagnosis is more important because that immediately it will reflect in the treatment of the patient. Researching is a long-term process. It's an ongoing process. Even when you diagnose, you are researching only. If I diagnose something, if I isolate some fungus from a patient, and it is known to be usually fluconazole sensitive, but this is resistant. So is it not research? So research is already happening while you're doing diagnosis. So you don't have to worry about that. For intensive researching, you should always keep it at the second or the third level. First is the diagnostics and the service to the patient and the population. Any more questions? No, ma'am. OK. So. So. OK, uh, Romy. Uh, uh, ma'am, hello. Yes. Uh, ma'am, kindly next session arrange on the AFST especially on mold fst of mold uh, i think uh, my croatia group will handle that there are many experts in the field of afst i don't consider myself an expert in this i'm only trying to explore all possible options to make uh, my learning uh, upgrade my learning and to uh, you know extrapolate it to the benefit of the society uh, frankly speaking i am not an expert in afst although we do it at our laboratory so my Asia may arrange uh, any expert uh, in this field uh, so that you know more. OK, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We will do that. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for uh, such a wonderful uh, session. Oh, and uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Vijalata, ma'am, uh, for enlightening us with the knowledge of laboratory diagnosis of fungal <laughs> infections and helping us to know that why fungal infections are being public threat these days. Thank you so much, ma'am, for enlightening us. Uh, I'm thankful to all the participants for being equally active throughout the session. Uh, I also thank Dr. Shinoy, sir, and Maiko Asia for organizing such a knowledgeable workshop. Lastly, I'm thankful to Dr. Anandita and Maiko Asia team for their uh, kind cooperation. Thank you, one and all. Uh, now it's over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a wonderful uh, two, two and a half hours with you, and uh, we hope to connect with you again. And uh, yeah, I will share some, exchange some notes about uh, connecting uh, medical mycology with the environmental mycology. Yes. That I also yeah. I also discussed that issue with the Vinay when he presented uh, some months back, I guess. Uh, it's wonderful that you have spent your Sundays, a Sunday with us. But we have learned a lot from you, and uh, this uh, learning will continue. Thank you so much. As you teach, you learn, and as you learn, you teach. So it's a, always a you know bidirectional process. And thank you so much for the opportunity. And special thanks to Dr. Vinay, you know, who was instrumental in actually giving me the opportunity here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your loveful company. Wish you all a very happy Sunday.
yeah thank you thank so you. much yeah with this thank we will so uh, to all of you we had a very wonderful session with vijayalata i hope in soon to uh, gain lo uh, a lot of uh, information from you. thank you bill sir and romi and all the my team thank you thank you thank you one and all Uh, yeah with this we close this session thank you well everybody have a good day there bye bye bye